And bow your heads, please, as I read from God's Word. I'm going to read Psalm 71, verses 15 and 16. The Word says, My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation, all day long, though I know not its measure. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O Sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we have any righteousness, it comes from God. And we owe Him so much. And we are yet, we are sinners. And we need to repent and humble ourselves before God. Would you pray for each other and pray for yourselves that you would pray that you would repent of your sins before God? Would you pray for this service and lift up our hearts and our minds together as we go to the Lord in prayer? Let us pray in the name of Jesus. Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you. You are God and there is no other. You are the creator. You are holy and righteous, Lord, and we are sinners. We humble ourselves before you and we say, have mercy on us, Lord, for we believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is your son and he's alive today. He took our sins, Lord, and came our sin, and you accepted that sacrifice and so do we. Oh, hallelujah. Thank Thank you for your spirit that's with us, Lord. Thank you for being our God. And we humble ourselves before you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this service. And thank you for these, your people, Lord. Every soul, bless them, Lord. And every household, every family, bless them. Bless those, Lord, that cannot be here for whatever the reason. Maybe they are watching this at home right now on social media. Lord, please bless them and be with them. May we all, Lord, humble ourselves before you. May we worship you in spirit. May we give you glory and honor. May our lives, Lord, our souls be what you would have us to be. Let us rejoice in you and have your joy in our hearts. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Now we're going to sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Merciful and mighty, 
a God in three person, a blessed Trinity. Amen. Amen. Lord, I ask that you repeat after me, please. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please keep take your seats. And as you're taking your seats, turn in your Bible for the book of Jeremiah. When I talked to Brother Peace last week, that's one of the things he missed the most, he said, was worshiping Jesus that way. <laughs> Jeremiah 21, verses 1 through 14. Jeremiah 21, 1 through 14. Sister White will read for us in the Korean language. Sister White, please. 오늘 말씀은 21장 에네미야 1절에서 14절입니다. 히드기야 왕이 말기야의 아들 바스울과 제사장 마하세알의 아들 스바냐를 보내어 에네미야에게 말하기를 바벨로 왕 누부가세느살이 우리를 치니 청컨대 너는 우리를 위하여 여호와께 간구하라. 여호와께서 혹시 그 모든 기사로 우리를 도와 행하시며 그가 우리를 떠나리라 하던 그때에 여호와께로부터 에네미야에게 말씀이 임하니라. 에네미야가 그들에게 대답하되 너희는 히드기야에게 이같이 말하라. 이스라엘의 하나님 여호와께서 이같이 말씀하시되 보라 너희가 성 밖에서 바벨론 왕과 또 너희를 내온 갈대와인과 싸우는 바 너희 손에 가진 병기를 내가 돌이킬 것이요 그들은 이성 중에 모아 드리리라 내가 든 성과 강한 팔곧 노와 분과 대노로 친히 너희를 칠 것이며 내가 또이 성에 거주하는 자를 사람이나 짐승이나 다 치리니 그들이 큰 연병에 죽으리라 하셨다 하라 여호와께서 또 말씀하시되 그 후에 내가 유다 왕 히드기야와 그 신하들과 백성과 및이 성읍에서 연병과 칼과 기근에서 남은 자를 바벨론 왕 누부각센 살의 손과 그 대적의 손과 그 생명을 찾는 자들의 손에 붙이리니 그가 칼날로 그들을 치되 아끼지 아니하며 국률이 여기지 아니하며 불쌍히 여기지 아니하리라 하셨느니라 여호와께서 가라사대 너는 또이 백성에게 여호와께서 이같이 말씀하신다 하라 보라 내가 너희 앞에 생명의 길과 사망의 길을 두었노니 이 성에 거주하는 자는 칼과 기근과 연병에 죽으려니와 너희를 해온 갈대와 인에게 나가서 항복하는 자는 살리니 그의 생명을 노량한 것 같이 얻으리라. 나 여호와가 말하노라 내가 나의 얼굴을 이 성에서 이 성으로 항함은 복을 위함이 아니요 하를 위함이라. 이 성이 바벨론 왕의 손에 붙임이 될 것이요 그는 그것을, 그것을 불로 살으리라. 유다 왕의 집에 대한 여호와의 말을 들으라. 나 여호와가 이같이 말하노라. 다윗의 집이여, 너는 아침마다 공편이 판결하여 탈취당한 자를 악박자 악박자의 손에서 건지라. 그리하지 아니하면 너희는 악행을 인하여 내 노가 불같이 일어나서 살으리니 능히 끌자가 없으리라. 나 여호와가 이르노라. 골짜기와 평원 반석의 거민을 보라. 너희가 말하기를 누가 내려와서 우리를 치리요? 누가 우리의 거처에 들어오리요? 하거니와 나는 내 대적이라 내가 너의 행인대로 벌할 것이요 내가 또 숯불에 불을, 불을 놓아 그 사경을 살으리라 여호와의 말이니라 아멘 Jeremiah 21 verses 1 through 14 The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pesher son of Malkijah and the priest Zephaniah son of Messiah. They said, Inquire now of the Lord for us, because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us as in times past, so that he will withdraw from us. But Jeremiah answered them, Tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them into this city. 
I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both men and animals, and they will die of a terrible plague. After that, declares the Lord, I will hand over Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the people in this city to, who survive, to the plague, sword, and famine, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who seek their lives. He will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy or pity or compassion. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says, See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. He will escape with his life. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. Moreover, say to the royal house of Judah, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of David. This is what the Lord says. Administer justice every morning. Rescue from the hand of his oppressor the one who has been robbed. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. I am against you, Jerusalem. You who live above this valley on the rocky plateau, declares the Lord. You who say, who can come against us? Who can enter our refuge? I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in your forest and will consume everything around you. Amen. Let's pray, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message, O oh Lord, please. Please give us, Lord, your understanding. May your Holy Spirit anoint us, Lord. May we be open to your spirit and open to your word, and may we draw near to you through this word. May we have an understanding that only you can give to us, Lord. Let us draw near to you, for it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. This is the kind of sermon that I don't particularly like to preach, but if it's the truth, it's the truth, and if it's in God's Word, it's in God's Word. No hope. No hope. You know, the more I read God's Word and look at the history, not just what's here, but all the history of mankind, the more I read it and see people, the more I get upset about the arrogance of people and their treatment of our holy God. I get so upset because people mistreat God. You know, most people think they can do anything they want, and then all they have to do is ask God to forgive them, and guess what? He will. Now you say, wait a minute, isn't that true? Well, what I mean is this. Their hearts are really not in them saying sorry to God. In other words, they're really not sorry. They're sorry that they're getting punished. They're sorry that God knows, but they're not really sorry for their sins. It's like me as a child. I can remember, and so can you. When I get a spanking, I was sorry I was getting a spanking. I really wasn't sorry for what I did some of the time. Let's be honest. Isn't that the way we are? We're sorry we get caught. You get a speeding ticket, you're sorry you got caught. Not because you were speeding. Let's be honest. Well, that's the way people are, and they're that way toward God. Now, don't get me wrong, I realize, however, I realize that I'm just as evil, I'm just as evil and sinful uh, as these people that I'm talking about because I, you can include me because if it were not for the loving, long-suffering God, I could easily be responding uh, today the same way that these evil people in Jeremiah were doing. I'm just as guilty as they are. I deserve the punishment just as much as they do. 
In today's text, we're going to see how the evil king of Judah sends his representative to Jeremiah. He wants Jeremiah to do something for him. He wants Jeremiah to put in a good word to God. See, we know Jeremiah. He, he's, he's a good prophet, and, and he's close to God. So if he goes in and puts in a good word so that Nebuchadnezzar will stop his attack against Judah, it might work. His scheme does not work, though, with our holy and great God. Zedekiah doesn't like the answer that he's getting back from God Almighty. I want us to understand this. I want us to see what's going on, and I want you to have a good understanding this morning. That's the reason we're talking about this. So first, let's look at how this whole thing happened in Zedekiah, Zedekiah's question. His question is, this chapter begins by making it clear that prior to the future coming of the exalted son of David, the Messiah, the doom of Jerusalem is under the present sons of David is certain. In other words, under the present sons of David during this time, Jerusalem was doomed. Neither Zedekiah or any of his current relations, his brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, therefore, none of them could be really the hope of Jerusalem or Judah, could they? None of the family of David at that time really gave Judah any hope. This passage here contains Yahweh's, God's response, when Zedekiah, during that last torment of the siege of Jerusalem, probably around uh, 587 B.C., he sent his ministers, he sent these men, instead of going himself, he sent his ministers to Jerusalem, to Jeremiah to intercede on behalf of him to God Almighty. In verse 1, Pasher, the son of Malchijah, was one of those who called for Jeremiah to be in prison because of this, before this event. He, ta- he had called Jeremiah to be in prison because of his prophecies. And, and he was probably one of the king's uh, chief ministers, if not the chief minister. We already know in the record that he wanted Jeremiah to go to prison, and yet he's here told to go and humble himself before Jeremiah and ask for something. Believe me, he was no friend of Jeremiah. He is not said to have been a priest, and both his, uh, his name and his father's names are pretty common names in that day of time. Zephaniah was a priest. He went also, and he appears to have been more neutral as appears from the fact here that he read to Jeremiah the prophetic letter, which was being circulated by Shemamiah uh, the Nehemite later in in Jeremiah 29, 29. When I looked up his name, and I I found him later on in Jeremiah 29. He was a, a priest. But he was uh, not what you'd call a great priest. Uh, He's nowhere mentioned in one of Jeremiah's adversaries, though. He's not mentioned as someone who was trying to kill Jeremiah. He was the second priest after the high priest, probably holding the same position previously that Pasher, the son of Emmer, which is a different Pasher, had held. That's the reason the name Pasher is so common. I told you several pastures, and he had previously been sent to Jeremiah with his intercession was being sought by Zedekiah at the first time when the Egyptians, the Egyptians had temporarily caused a raising of the siege against Jerusalem before this. He was later handed over to Nebuchadnezzar at Relah uh, along with the high priest. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. The sending of Zedekiah, of his prime minister, and the second priest is like the sending of an important delegation uh, to Isaiah uh, by Hezekiah, which is really a comparable situation back in 2 Kings 19, and even in Isaiah 37 too. We have a similar situation, 
But I, and I think that's what Zedekiah in our scripture here had in mind because he knew this had been done before. He knew that Jeremiah had done it before. But in that case, it resulted in a different outcome. It resulted in a remarkable deliverance for Jerusalem. I'm, I'm sure that Zedekiah said, it worked once before, maybe it's going to work again. You know, Maybe it'll work again. And clearly, Zedekiah, he, he hoped for the exact same thing. But here's the difference. The difference lay in the fact that Hezekiah was held in greater regard than, than Zedekiah was by God. You see, Hezekiah actually had a little bit of a relationship with God, whereas Zedekiah had no relationship at all. Hezekiah had previously uh, paid greater heed to God's prophets. He had listened to God's prophets, and he had made some differences. And the people were at that time, they were not so steeped and so far in idolatry. And even the temple itself had been recently purified. Conditions were very different during that time than now. You see, it's like this. They had a relationship with God before and they went to Jeremiah and asked for help and God helped them. Now they have no relationship, but they think they can do the same thing again and it's not going to work. Such a crisis, though, what else could Zedekiah do? Really, there was nothing else he could do, was there? Who else could he turn to? What else could he do? Zedekiah's request was that Jeremiah, as the one whose prophecies had proved correct, would inquire on their behalf of God with the hope that God would deal with us according to all his wondrous works and would, that he would be the Savior of Israel and Judah, just like he did in the past. By the way, this is the first time that Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned by name. Zedekiah had rebelled, and he encouraged by Egypt, but against the advice of Jeremiah, which was why Nebuchadnezzar was now, who was attacking Jerusalem, because they were right outside. They were right outside, and Judah was in trouble. Judah was in trouble. Jerusalem was in trouble. God's people was in trouble. Because we have God's answer. God's sad answer was not only would he not help them, but that then rather than making them strong in the use of their weapons, he would in fact turn their own weapons against them. Or at least he would render them sort of useless so that they would not be successful in defending the city. Now, I want you to know there's a hint here of some conflicts within the city, within the people themselves. There's some conflicts. They, arguments maybe arose as to whether they should surrender or not because they knew the prophecies of God. Think about this for a second. You got the ones who are arrogant and want to hang on and say, no, no, we will not give up. And yet the prophet's telling them, give up. God's prophecy's already been told. This is what's going to happen. You can't change it. Maybe you should obey God and give up. Oh, no, I'm not going to give up. I'm a man. I'm going to hang in there. I don't care what that prophet says. I don't care what God says. Think about it. Should they surrender or not? So there's some conflicts even between God's people. It's made very clear here at this stage that Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army were outside the walls already. They were besieging the city and they were seeking to break these walls down. God declared that he himself would be fighting against Jerusalem with his power and his might. To me, verse 5 that we read is one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Honestly, when God says to you, 
I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath. Now, when God Almighty says that to you, what can you do? Think about it. What can you do? Hopeless. It's called hopeless. Because you cannot stand against God. We cannot stand against God. And God goes on in verse 6 to say, I will strike down those who live in this city, both man and beast, and they will die of a terrible plague. You see, initially, God's anger would be revealed in the city by a terrible plague within the city. You know what? In a besieged city in those days, they were always short of water and they was always short of food, right? because they couldn't go out to get food, they couldn't go out to get water, and they were weakened by starvation and lack of water. And you know what happens? Diseases come. When we get weak, our bodies get weak, we don't eat right, what happens? It's easy for us to get sick, right? That's the reason when somebody gets sick, what's the first thing mama wants to do? Feed you. That's the reason Koreans try to make you eat if you're sick. And most of you are sick, you don't, what you don't feel like doing? Eating. I'm sick, I don't feel like eating, eat anyway. <laughs> well, we all know that's true, isn't it? Because we know you need that food to have strength. If you can't get food, you can't get water, your body gets weaker and weaker. The things that your body fights, you cannot fight anymore. But some people, some people would live on through the plague. They were strong enough. They were probably the ones that had been eaten a lot earlier, and they were healthy like me, fat. And they had a lot to live with, you know? Once starvation and pestilence had done its worst, though, it would all prove in vain, for the end was still coming. According to verse 7, those who lived on after the pestilence and the famine and the sword, they would be delivered to the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and of their enemies and those who sought their lives. So even if they were strong enough to live through the plague and diseases, the famine, they were still in jeopardy. There's going to be a great slaughter, basically. There's going to be no mercy because they had not surrendered. Catch that now. There's going to be no mercy because they didn't surrender. Look again with me at verse 8 of our text. I want to read it again, verse 8, because it's the way out. It's the way out. Verse 8 of our text says, Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord said. See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Now you see what he told, what did Jeremiah, or God tell Jeremiah? God says what? He tells them to tell the people. This is the first time in here where he says, tell the people. Well, why does he want to tell the people? So that the people can make a decision based on God's word and God's prophet. He says, tell the people, I'm setting before you a way of life and a way of death. Very clearly here. These words, When you look at them, I think that they are deliberately, deliberately an an ironic parallel of Moses' word back in Deuteronomy 30, uh, verses 15 and 19. In fact, I want to read them, if you would, if you'd turn with me back in Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 19. That's Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 19. And see if you recognize what we just read back over here in verse 8 of our text in Jeremiah. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 19. It says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commands, decrees and laws. 
Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But, I hate that word, but. But, if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life, and death, blessings, and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Isn't that what Jeremiah verse 8 says? I'm sitting before you today two ways, either life or death. You choose. Back in Jeremiah here, it is a literal choice, a literal choice between living and dying. God was not offering a life of well-being anymore. That's past. That's gone. That, that offer was made and rejected by God's people. There's no life of well-being here. It's life or death. Simply the possibility that's here is a survival for those who would surrender to the Babylonians before it was too late. In other words, he's not, worship, he's not telling you he's going to bless you. He's telling you, you want to live or you want to die? One or the other. That's what he put before the people. And for them, if they were going to live, if they would live, it would be a life of poverty or exile. But at least, think about this, at least they would be alive. And what have we always as Christians said? As long as there is life in me, there is hope. Because God is a merciful, loving God. As long as I have life, I have hope. The problem is we don't know how long we have life. The problem is we don't know how long we're going to live. We must not underestimate here in this verse the courage that Jeremiah has saying this. Y'all think about this for a second because really if you think about it, if he'd been in the army, he would be telling people to quit and give up and desert the army, wouldn't he? Wouldn't that be what he's saying? He's simply bringing out the hopelessness of the situation because of what God has said. But God had told him what to do. It doesn't matter what the army says to do. It doesn't matter what the bosses say. It doesn't matter what the king says. God says this. Another lesson for us to catch on to. It took courage for Jeremiah. He could have been as actually recommending, to think about it, the desertion in the face of the enemy and and basically, he was offering hope. The only hope was to desert. He says, whoever stays in this city will die by the sword and famine or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. The truth was that really at this point, Jeremiah had no hope to offer to the people other than to live or die. That's the only thing that God gave him to offer to the people. The time for hope was past. Just like with Pharaoh in Egypt in the time of Moses, he had hardened his heart too much too often. The only hope of anyone surviving the, uh, would be to desert this city. Going over 
to the Babylonians who were outside the walls. That's the only way, and only those who did that would live. Only those who did that would live. Now you may say, well, that doesn't sound like the God that I know, but think about this. Let's look at God's reasoning here. God, he finalized his message by, of doom by emphasizing that he has set his face against the city for evil and not for good. This was the prophetic and certain word of God. It's not like he hadn't sent his prophets time and time again and told them he gave them time and time again. He gave them uh, ability to... to Repent. More times than you and I would have given them. It would thus be given into the hands of the king of Babylon who would burn it with fire. Burning with fire is what the, the leaders in those days regularly did with a city who had continually rebelled and didn't surrender. If they had surrendered... Bab uh, Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have burnt the city. He wouldn't have burnt it. But they wouldn't even surrender. And he burnt it because this was literally fulfilled. Jeremiah now makes a general plea, and this plea is to the house of David. Did y'all catch that at the end of it? The house of David. He made a plea to them to cease from being so presumptuous and to fulfill its responsibility as the house of David with regard to how they reigned and they should reign in justice and fair play. Had it done so, the present troubles could have been avoided. The house of David had failed in its responsibility. On the other hand, had they responded to God by obeying God, the house of David could have gone forward in triumph and had been established forever. This emphasis on the house of David and what was required of it is actually, think about this, is preparing the way for the fact that one day a representative of the house of David called the righteous branch or the root would arise and guess what he would do he would rule righteously and truly hallelujah that's what's going on here that's exactly what's going on is because no human beings could do it you see this general plea to the house of david and it was what they should fulfill the requirements of that house and faithfully execute justice and deliver the oppressed and with the warning that if they failed to do so, God's wrath would go forth like an unquenchable fire because of the evil of what they were doing. The truth was that instead of Jerusalem having a bastion of justice and fair play, instead of being a really good place to live, had become the home of presumption and arrogance with a, basically a feeling that the people, that they could do anything they wanted and they wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of their actions. They thought, I can do whatever I want because I'm a child of God. They were so certain of their sacredness that they didn't even think about the possibility that Jerusalem could actually fall. And our text finishes with verse 14. I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in your forest that will consume everything around you. If only, if only God's people had judged righteously and delivered the oppressed and walked in obedience to the covenant of God. But the arguments did not stand up when they practiced injustice, 
They couldn't argue with God because they were not obeying God. They themselves were the cause of the oppression of the oppressed. They had forsaken the very covenant that they had made with God. In other words, the fruit of their doing, their deeds, had canceled out any holiness that they had. So in conclusion, i got to tell you this. There was no immediate hope for Jerusalem. Did you hear what I just said? There was no immediate hope for Jerusalem. You see, they had gone too far. Their hope would only come later with the Holy One of God, the Messiah the Son of God, the Son of David, Jesus the Christ. But until he came, there was no hope for Jerusalem. Now listen, please don't misunderstand this morning. I don't want to leave you like this, but I want you to think about this. God's love for us lasts forever. But his patience does not last forever. Didn't hear very many amens that time, did I? Yeah, we love it because God's love lasts forever, but what about that patience? Pretty obvious God's patience does not last forever, does it? All I got to tell you is this, brothers and sisters. Come out. Come out of the sinful condition that you may be in. Come out before it's too late. You have life. There's hope for you. You know why there's hope for you? Because Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, he has come. He's willing to be your sin. He's willing to take your sin. But you must give it to him. You must give him your heart. He is our hope. Without him, we are just as hopeless as those who lived in Jerusalem, even those that Jeremiah and God was talking to. Without Jesus Christ, we are without hope. Because Jesus is our hope or we have no hope. Please, come to Jesus today. Let us pray.